Good morning to you and welcome in the name of Jesus to our Sunday morning celebration. As I continually say, it is a privilege and a joy to have you with us. I'm sure like me, you're finding that the weeks fly by and our lives are filled with many, many things that we still have to accomplish in these days when we're seeing such uh, results from this pandemic. And time is passing at such a pace. I know what my parents used to say to me, that time will speed up as you age. And I used to think that was quite amusing, but actually it is a reality. It certainly seems to. I don't know whether that's to do with the busyness of ministry life or just age and stage, but it seems to be a fact for me in these days. I don't know what the days are like for you at the moment. It may well be that this next lockdown has had a major effect upon your thinking. The isolation seems more intense. There's a disconnection with family and loved ones. And having just come through the Christmas period, the New Year celebrations, it may well be that this is the toughest time that you've experienced so far. It also may be that you've experienced personal loss and sorrow. And if that's where you are, as a church and ministry, our hearts go out to you. Now begin this service by reminding you that the promise of the Lord is that he will never leave you or forsake you. As we begin this service, I want to ask you to draw upon the knowledge that you have from how the Lord has loved you and brought you through so many things in your past. And in these present days, we can draw from that knowing that the same Lord who delivered us in the past will deliver deliver us again. Invite him into these moments as we begin this celebration. And I pray that this time we spend in the presence of the Lord will be a time of encouragement, of real input at a deep personal level into your life so that you can arise in faith with renewed hope and assurance that you will come through. There's a statement often said in the Bible, and it came to pass. Friends, let me remind you that even though these days are dark, they will pass and a new day will come. So as we begin our service today, may the hand of the Lord rest upon you. Let's have a great time of praise and worship in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. 
thank you for life itself and acknowledge who you are. You are indeed worthy, Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power. And you created all things, and by your will they exist. In the midst of this global pandemic, Lord, we thank you this morning that we are alive and well. And we are grateful, Lord, that you allowed us to see this year of 2021. You know that many who last year started their life's journey with dreams and aspirations never saw them to the end. Indeed, Lord, many throughout the world who started 2021 have already had their dreams and hopes crushed by this virus and other mishaps of life. So in the name of Jesus, the name above every other name, we raise our hands to you and with a grateful heart we say thank you that we're here today. Thank you for the loved ones, children, spouses and elderly relatives in different parts of the world whom we haven't been able to meet and see as planned. But you in your mercy and grace have kept them alive. We pray you continue to guide and protect them, their minds and their bodies in the name of Jesus. And uncertainties, discouragement and sufferings all around, we ask for your grace to be able to focus on you, Lord. Even as Peter left the boat amidst the waves and roaring winds, yet with your assurance, he still lost his focus. May we not lose our focus at this time. And Lord, even if we do, as you extended your hand of grace to Peter, extend those same hands to us, your children, at this time, and indeed at all times, in the name of Jesus. Remember those working in the front line of this pandemic, Lord, all the hospital staff and the support network. Lord, bless and protect each and every one of them and their families. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we intercede and remember those who are in a seriously bad place at the moment, Lord, because of rest restrictions and the lockdown. Lord, we pray for families that are in a pressure cooker type situation and environment, facing serious relationship and marital issues and tensions and seemingly no solution in sight. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we command your divine intervention. We pray for those who have lost their jobs or on a very reduced income. Lord, make way in their situation. We pray for the children unable to attend school. Keep them, O oh Lord, and guide them. Finally, we stand on your word which assures us that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall not fear. Amen and amen. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. Christ the right.
One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at three in the afternoon. Now a man, who was lame from birth, was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those who who were going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Amen. Everything we've all
As I begin the message this morning, I want to remind you of where we were last Sunday because I'm continuing in the theme looking at the Acts of the Apostles. We're gaining knowledge from how the Lord moved in the establishment and the development of the early church and the passion and the new power and authority that came upon those believers, causing boldness at a serious high level, was a result of how God moved in their own personal lives. And I remind you that we looked at the fact that the disciples devoted themselves to several things. And it caused a structure uh, into their spiritual life that actually meant they were effective. And I highlighted that not only did they draw upon the Spirit's power in their life, but they also had the disciplines and they'd learned how to live out practically in order to cause their service effective. But what did they devote their life to? They devoted their lives to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And the Bible says that as they uh, continued every day to serve God in this way, the Lord added daily to their number those who were being saved. Hallelujah. Well, as we come to chapter 3 of the Acts of the Apostles, and I said last week, it should be really called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. We are looking at that amazing miracle, the first miracle witnessed by the disciples uh, as the Holy Spirit was poured out. And it's positioned exactly where it's meant to be in the Word of God. Tony read these first 10 verses and I want to say that the truth and the revelation of this story has so much to say to us today. We're going to look at three things. Firstly, the miracle itself. Secondly, the message in the miracle. God has something to say to us relevant for today from this miracle. And then thirdly, we'll move into the message relevant for every generation from this occurrence, including our own. And it's even more relevant for us because as time speeds forward, as I mentioned in my introduction, we are nearer now to the coming of the Lord than we ever were before. Let me begin. And we begin at verse 1 by looking at what happened. It is Peter and John, the two disciples, who are making their way to the temple. Because as I said last Sunday, it took a while for the church away uh, to, to break away from Judaistic practices as the Lord developed new ways of, and the fresh outpouring of the Spirit in the church. New ways of worship new ways of praying continually rather than specific times. But it is the prayer time. And that means it was around three o'clock in the afternoon that these two men made their way to the temple. And seated outside the temple at a place called the Gate Beautiful is a man begging. The Bible tells us that he was lame he was unable to move forward himself. And that meant that he was unable to work and provide for himself. Therefore, he is outside the temple begging. Not only did he find himself struggling with these things in life from birth, it tells us, but it also meant that he was excluded from religious practices, that he would have been looked down upon as if God had judged him. But that wasn't the case. He would have been excluded. He would have been isolated from general society. He would have been reliant on the help of others. And he would have also been separated. 
Imagine the feelings that would constantly run through the mind of this man, how he would view himself. He would not feel he was at the level as every, of everybody else, that he was reliant and dependent upon anyone who would give him finance to live. Even to move, he was reliant on others. And every day he would position himself in this place. Actually, friends, it was real and it was tough for that man. But in our story, it is an image of where a person is until they come to Christ. Positioned outside, isolated and separated, excluded from the blessings and the favour that only salvation in Christ can bring. And so in this place, there was a desperation in his heart and in his life. And as he was in that place and position, at the gate called Beautiful, and I want to remind you that Jesus himself is called the gate, and he is the beautiful one. He's the wonderful. He's the counsellor. He's the mighty God. He's the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And here, there is the representation of the man outside of the gate. And yet he longs to be able to make progress in through the gate. And Christ as the gate is the access. He's the access into grace. He's the access into our salvation. He's the access into eternal life. He's the access into heaven. And that's exactly the image that has been portrayed in these verses. And on this occasion, Peter and John arrive at that place and the man looks at them and he's asking them for finance. Can they give him something to help him in his hour of desperate need? And I love the story because when Peter and John saw him, they didn't just rush past him. Something incredible had happened in the hearts of Peter and John, has they been filled with the Spirit, more compassion, more love, more care, more desire to help and to bless their fellow man. It was real and it was genuine. And as they looked at this man, this man grabbed their attention. And as they were about to enter, he asked them for money. And the man looked at them, giving him them complete attention. He was expecting to receive something from them. And then our story continues. And Peter said, silver and gold we do not have, but what we do we have we give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. There is significance in the statement that Peter makes. Firstly, he says, silver and gold I don't have. He wasn't a wealthy man. Maybe he didn't have any change on him. That was the reality of the circumstances on the day. But actually, it's a reference to the fact that the most costly treasures of earth could never cause this man to rise to his feet and walk. Only the greatest treasure. The pearl of great price, only through the power of Christ himself, could this man rise from where he was positioned every day, outside of the temple, excluded and separated, outside of salvation, and come through the gate, the access point, into the temple. And we know in the New Testament context, this did not refer to a temple built with human hands, although it was physically present in that day. But actually, it was pointing to the gate, the access, who would cause the temple that would be built with not with human hands, but through the building of Christ's work himself. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Believe you me, friends, even this pandemic and the days in which we're living and the changed life in which we're living shall not cause the church to be lost 
or to not continue to grow. Christ will build his church and even the powers of hell and death shall not have success against the building of God's temple and God's house. In reality for this man, the moment of miraculous change was about to come. Change not only physically as he would receive a real miracle that day, but also spiritually. And this man is helped to his feet. He's pulled up in faith by the apostles. And the Bible says he leaps to his feet. Hallelujah. He leaps to his feet. It might well be that that's the type of decision of faith that you are going to make today from your separation, from your isolation and from where you're positioned spiritually outside of salvation yet. And that leap of faith and trust in God will cause you to rise to your spiritual feet and you'll walk through the gate, through the access and be included in the temple of God, the church. And so this man, he leaps to his feet. He runs in. The Bible says he goes into the temple with Peter and John, praising God and jumping for joy. He celebrated and I tell you, the people recognized him saying, is this not the man that used to sit at the gate beautiful? This is the man. And they were filled with awe and amazement at what had happened to him. Hallelujah. What a story. A great miracle. It's a real miracle, not a myth. It's a true miracle. That's the miracle itself. What about the message in the miracle, friend? Because the message in the miracle is to us that it is possible for us to remain outside, excluded and separated from God. And that's exactly the gospel message. The Bible says until we come through Christ, the gate, into a salvation. And we come by confessing our sin and our need of his grace and his mercy and his love and his healing power to touch us. And friends, you've been unable to make any spiritual progress every day, no matter what you do. You're unable to make spiritual progress. But when Christ comes into your life and you come through the access into his grace, which is through the cross and his resurrection, through his death and the shedding of his blood and through the power of his resurrection, then we come into this miraculous grace. And it is by grace through faith, faith through grace, that we are saved. What a miracle, miracle can happen for us as we reach out, take our leap of trust and commit our hand into the one who will lift us and run into the courts of his glory, praising and thanking God for his healing and his deliverance. What a message there is in this miracle today. And then friend, in the message of this miracle, there was an enormous challenge, a challenge for those who heard Peter preach on that day. And I'd have to say that Peter was preaching as a result of what God had done. And the boldness and the authority and the strength was at a level that Peter had never known before. And we have to recognize that. You remember, Peter was regarded as the hothead. He was the one who locked off the servants here, who was saying he would never leave. He would never fail. But in his natural ability, he did. And he denied the Lord three times before the cock crowed, just as Christ had prophesied he would. And I love the fact that Jesus chooses Peter to stand up on this day after the first miraculous sign in the book of Acts and to be the mouthpiece. You see, it doesn't matter if we failed in the past. God can take hold of us as a person, as a person, as a man or a woman, young person, as a child, fill us with his spirit and bring a new boldness and authority in life even to be able to preach under the power of the Spirit. Hallelujah. 
And so he stands and he actually says several things that would have caused a venomous reaction in those who were not ready for salvation. But for those who were searching and longing for someone to tell them how to be saved, it would have dropped in their hearts and minds like the gold of revelation and the silver of understanding. And so what he says is seen in verse 13. First of all, he says, you handed him over to be killed, Jesus Christ. He explains that this miracle was not done by his own power, but by the power of God, through the power of Christ. And it was you, he means that generation was the one that handed the Christ over to be flogged, punished and crucified. Oh my, my, this must have been something that cut right through to the heart of these people. Verse 15 says, you killed the author of life. But God raised him from the dead. Hallelujah. Are you glad that the Bible is full of those words that begin a, begin a whole new chapter? But God raised him from the dead. So you handed him over and you killed the author of life. Can I just say, friends, that that generation is representative of every one of us? Because if we had been there, our sin and our anger and the way we would have been, we'd have gone with the crowd. But thanks be to God, as the Spirit has been poured out upon all flesh, you've been looking at the way God has been moving and birthing things since that new dispensation of grace and mercy and the inauguration of the church. We can see that now by the power of God's love and grace and understanding and mercy, we can acknowledge we put him on the cross. Our sin put him upon the cross. But thanks be to God. He rose again from the dead. You know, as, a, as an evangelist, I know I'm functioning as a pastor, but as an evangelist, I uh, have that favorite verse in my heart constantly from Romans that says that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and if you proclaim with all of your heart that Christ is risen from the dead, you shall be saved. Hallelujah. It doesn't say that if you then add certain things and do this and do that and do the other, you'll be saved. It simply says, if you come through the access gate, through Christ, you'll be saved. Is that where you're positioned? Are you still outside? Are you still excluded and separated from the glorious salvation that you can know in your own heart and life today? Or have you come in through the access point. It's a beautiful entrance that you can have today into the glorious knowledge of salvation. Hallelujah. And then thirdly, the message relevant for every generation. Well, friends, I've just shared it. But there's a dimension I need to point out from the verses I said I would read. And I'm in Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Repent then and turn to God. Look at that again. Repent then and turn to God. Simply means turn around from your empty way of life, the life that that man had known, empty of all love, empty of all provision, empty of ability to move, empty of ability to be included. What a transformation. Repent then. And turn to God so that your sins might be wiped out. That times of refreshing might come from the Lord. Friends, wouldn't you say that today in these months of pandemic and however long it will be, wouldn't it be right for me to say as a pastor and evangelist to say that the most important, relevant message for this generation right now is that we repent and turn to God, that our sins might be wiped out and that times of refreshing might come from the Lord. I love the vocabulary that the word uses here, sins wiped out. 
you know, it's the impression that there's been some writing on the blackboard of your life and it's been recorded as if it would be there forever. Nothing else can wipe it except the blood of Jesus. No one else can remove the record of your sin except the cross and the death of Christ. But when Christ comes into your life, the transformation is so vast. The Bible says your sins are remembered no more. There's no eternal record. It's been wiped out. It's a clean start. And that's why the Bible says the old has gone and the new has come. The most relevant message for this generation is here in these verses. Sins wiped out and times of refreshing of the spirit to come upon your life. Could you not take advantage of these days where we're locked down and seek God with all your heart and let times of refreshing come over your soul and your spirit? Don't let oppression, depression and fear to flood you, to overwhelm you, but to allow the refreshing of God's spirit and divine touch to be upon you in these days. And the final aspect here in this verse I'm looking at, the most relevant message for this generation concludes with this, and that he, the Father, may send the Christ who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. He must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago. Wow. You know, there's that statement in the English language in a nutshell. Friends, this is the gospel in a nutshell. Repent then, turn to God. The times of refreshing may come and that he might send the Christ and that everything in God's appointed time may be completed. The fact that we are living through such dark days and this pandemic does not change one thing in the calendar and the eternal agenda of God Almighty. You can trust him, friend. You can be assured that he will do all things right and well in his time. It came to pass and it will pass. But if you are seated outside of God's salvation, this is a day for you to repent of sin, Turn to God, that times of refreshing might come, that he might send the Christ and all things will be completed. I pray that the message in this miracle will be life transforming for you. And as you walk through these days of lockdown, which we don't know how long that will be, I pray that the times of the refreshing of God's spirit will overwhelm you in a way that you've never known and you will arise and you will run in, constantly running in to the presence and into the atmosphere of the glory of God in the temple, in his house. May the Lord continue to bless you, protect you and keep you until he comes. In Jesus' name, amen.
As we draw things to a close this morning, I once again would like to address you personally. As a pastor, I love the opportunity of sitting with people on a one-to-one basis and hearing their story and praying with them into their own personal circumstances and in some way to bring the counsel of God. And that's not possible right now. And so as I speak to you through this screen, I pray that somehow miraculously, God will wrap his arms around you. To be aware of the comfort and the peace and the strength that actually only Christ can bring. And to recognize that that is beyond what any human can minister into your life. I pray in the name of Jesus that the intimacy of walking with Jesus in these days will grow for each one of us. They will be more conscious of his nearness. Promise of the word is underneath are the everlasting arms. And the context of those verses and those words is that someone has lost a loved one. There's been sorrow or loss in life, but nevertheless, underneath are the everlasting arms that hold you. The Bible says you're the apple of his eye and that he holds you in the hollow of his hand. And it says that he's placed you in the cleft of a rock and covered you with his hand. And so I pray in the name of Jesus as I remind you of how close Christ is to you. These days of isolation, 
and separation would be transformed into a newer, a new an awareness and nearness of Christ like we've never known. Now let me pray for you. Loving, gracious Father, I bring every person listening to this prayer today to the throne of grace. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will minister in the depth of hearts and minds today, that miracles like we've been hearing that happened in the life of that man would happen in hearts today. I pray also that even physical miracles will happen as I pray this prayer. All sickness and disease will be dealt with in the authority and the power of Jesus. We believe your word, Lord, that says by your stripes we are healed and that salvation means wholeness, spirit, soul, mind and body. It didn't say just sometimes or just occasionally, but even in the trials and the storms of life, we can know the wholeness of your salvation. So Lord, I pray that this will be the experience for every one of us. I pray particularly for our young people and our children, that there would be a revival in the church and that many thousands of young people will experience God and children will learn that Christ is the King of glory. Now, Father, over this coming week, I declare the peace and the blessing and the love of God would be shed abroad in hearts and homes unto him who has loved us and washed us from sin. Unto him be the glory forever. Amen. Hello, ladies, and Happy New Year. Our Hick Women's Ministry is putting on an online event just for you. When is this event taking place? On Saturday the 23rd of January at 7.30pm. You can watch it on YouTube, just like our Sunday online services. Simply connect using the link we'll send you by email before the event. Alternatively, search for HICC.org on YouTube at 7.30 on Saturday the 23rd to watch the premiere. What's it about? It's about giving thanks to God and celebrating His mercies in our lives over the past year. You'll hear powerful testimonies of healing and God's mercy, inspiring words of encouragement and songs of worship to bless your soul. So please make a note in your diaries and on your calendars. 7.30pm, Saturday the 23rd of January. Hick Women's Ministry Special Celebration and Thanksgiving event on YouTube. See you then.